It is my pleasure to help kick off the meeting um, with a fantastic keynote address from one of the folks that was in that early sort of founding cohort of uh, microbial genomic epidemiologists, one of the first to publish an investigation of a hospital-acquired uh, infection outbreak. Julie Segre is the chief and senior investigator at NHGRI's uh, Translational and Functional Genomic Institute, our branch. Um, that's the National uh, Human Genomics Research Institute in DC. Uh, Julie did her PhD at MIT with Eric Lander, uh, postdoc at the University of Chicago with Elaine Fuchs. Um, I probably screwed that name up, um, and joined NHGRI in the year 2000. Uh, Julie and I met in 2013. Uh, we were at a National Academy of Medicine meeting on the science and application of microbial genomics. I think Nick was at that meeting too. Um, Julie presented there on work she had done on elucidating the dynamics of a carbapenem resistant, um, carbapenemase resistant E. coli, uh, no, sorry, Klebsiella, um, in a large uh, NIH hospital. And it really was, as I said, one of the first investigations um, of a hospital acquired infection to use genomics. Um, Carl Zimmer wrote a fantastic piece on it in Wired magazine, which I think for many people was the first time they'd seen genomic epidemiology. Uh, and Julie and her co-investigator uh, received the 2009 Service to America uh, Medal for uh, their work on that outbreak. Since then, she has continued to innovate. Her lab um, balances two things, uh, lots of really interesting work on microbial diversity in human skin um, in uh, conditions and in uh, disease conditions in healthy states, and continued work on genomic epidemiology, particularly for those hospital-acquired infections. Um, Julie has been recognized in so many for, uh, for her her work. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. If she decides to pursue a third career in engineering, I'm sure she will succeed and get elected to the third of the National Academies and do the trifecta. But we're so lucky to have her here today um, to speak to us on Canada Auris, um, which is super, super scary. Uh, and anyone who's seen The Last of Us knows that uh, fungi are uh, something we really need to be concerned about. So we're grateful for Julie for making the time for us and telling us uh, how to defeat the fungi that will lead to the end of the world. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> well, thanks, Jen, for that really nice introduction. And it is absolutely a pleasure to be here today. Um, I look out on this audience and I think, of, you know, what it means to be back together with scientific community. And I look forward to meeting each and every one of you. So um, uh, just really nice to be here. And thank you to the organizers for including me. I am going to um, talk about our work that's really at the intersection of the human microbiome and um, microbial genomics. And um, I am going to talk about some unpublished data at the end and try to get some feedback on that, because this will be the first time I really talk about it. So I have marked those slides as unpublished. But um, the beginning parts is all sort of uh, a free for all. Yeah. OK. So just even from the beginning, when I say you know the human microbiome, I really do mean the bacteria, the fungi, and the viruses. And um, uh, and I am going to focus today on the fungi, but as you'll see, uh, when you go looking for the fungi, you often find other things. Um, and in particular, sort of like, you know, when we think about the human body, because I do a lot of work on commensals, and you'll see that too. And I think it's important to realize that I started in the Human Genome Project, and I used to think that we needed to understand these 23 human chromosomes, and that would help us you know, ameliorate human disease. But I've come to understand that a lot of the breakthroughs we've had have really been in the context of microbial communities and how they form a very intimate relationship with the humans. And there are as many, there are 30 trillion human cells, but there are as many bacteria and fungi, and way more viruses if you count the phage. So, you know, and the thing is that the bacterial diversity at the genomic level could even be much larger than the human diversity because of the genetic material that's in every, diff um, the different genetic material in every strain. So, for human skin, right? 
I mean, the, the skin microbiome is really important in terms of tuning the immune system, maintaining the skin barrier, but mostly probably today I'm going to be talking about providing colonization resistance. And I think this has been explored a lot in terms of Staph aureus and uh, bacteriosins and other um, antimicrobial peptides that are part of this colonization resistance. But we're going to sort of open up that lens a little bit. So I am going to focus today on Candida auris. So I want to give a little brief introduction about Candida auris and um, some parts about, you know, why this is now an emerging fungal pathogen. So the, the, the history of, of Candida auris is that 15 years ago, clinical samples of Candida auris were detected on three different continents. And those um, three strains or clades of Candida auris are 10,000 SNPs apart from each other. And we still have no idea how Candida auris emerged simultaneously on three different continents. Um, we have searched all of SRA. We've thought that we would find it. Uh, we still don't really know. There have been numerous ideas about really the use, the increased use of azoles that comes about in agriculture, in human health. Um, but we still do not understand the sort of history of how this could happen. But um, at this point, in the last five years in the US and in the UK and globally, we now have outbreaks occurring, primarily in uh, nursing homes where patients stay for a long time. However, you have seen some scary stories about um, how it may now even be found out in the community, it may now even be um, found in the environment. Why are we concerned about Canada auris? It is this trifecta. Um, I know I wrote four points, but it is a trifecta. <laughs> okay. Quadrella. Quadrella, which sounds like a rock concert. Okay. High levels of antimicrobial resistance. Basically, most of the strains are already azole resistant. Now, the thing is, fungi are eukaryotes. So it's really hard to slip a drug between killing Candida auris and killing the human host. With bacteria, you have a lot more space to put a drug that, or to find a class of drugs that could kill the bacteria without doing as much significant harm to human cells. There's not much space between a fungi and a eukaryotic human cell. So, and we have few drugs. So what we have is high levels of antimicrobial resistance. The, the concern is the bloodstream infections in patients. But the site of colonization that I'll show you um, is the skin. And the problem with the skin, which I'll also get into, is that um, it's really hard to prevent people from shedding into the environment. And Canada auris has set it up so that it persists in the environment. And that allows the transmission um, to keep spreading. Um, so I'll kind of go through this a little bit quickly, but like, it's now kind of rolling along where, oh, I should say, Candida auris is the first, um, uh, anim uh, the first fungi, um, or azole resistant Candida are the first fungi to be rated on the urgent threat list of CDC and also now the World Health Organization fungal pathogens. So this is actually kind of a big deal for our field. And there have been, I would refer you to Rebecca Drummond's piece in the conversation at University of Birmingham, but there have been lots of pieces about um, Candida auris and why it is so scary. Um, and some of them are a little unfair, um, but really it is true that we are seeing the spread of Candida auris. And I would, go, I would refer you to these trusted sources of information if you really want to know about Canada Auris. Um, they're really kept up to, well, they're kept up to date and they really do provide a lot of information. Okay, but from a research perspective, um, I, I won't go through this a lot, but this is part of why, you know, when we think about it, like we have just been fortunate that there hasn't been um, this kind of a fungi before. And the real problem is the loss of antifungal resistance, right? Um, and somehow Candida auris has 
navigated the space of acquiring azole resistance, echinokine resistant, amphotericin B resistance without paying much of a fitness cost. And so even the drug resistant forms are being spread. Um, and when they do in vitro evolution, it just seems like there are multiple pathways on the evolutionary landscape for developing antimicrobial resistance. OK. So now I'm going to start kind of say like a little bit from the beginning when we got involved, which involved um, a, a visit um, that we made to CDC and got to talking with Anna Litvin Seva and, and Tom Chiller. And they said, we really need, um, we have this new and emerging fungal pathogen. We'd like some, uh, we'd like some uh, animal model of it. And NIH and CDC are sort of the sister institutes of HHS. So the question that they initially posed to me was, does Canada auris um, actually colonize the skin or the gut? And this question of where is the site of colonization is kind of a critical point when you want to think about doing uh, screening. And at this point, Canada albicans colonizes the gut. And there really hadn't been a fungi that colonized the skin. Um, and so there was this idea that this, what we were seeing on the skin was just the fecal patina. It's a really nice way of saying that. <laughs> that. Um, uh, the fecal patina um, on nursing home patients. So the first thing we did was set about an experiment to test whether or not Candida auris, the primary site of colonization, was the skin or the gut so that we could think about um, how to control and, you know, uh, uh, do proper interventions and proper screening. So this was an animal model that we established in collaboration with my colleagues at NIAID, Mihalis Leonakis and Yasmin Belkade, where um, Yasmin and I, uh, a decade earlier, had set up this model of wild-type mice with an intact skin barrier, and you colonize the mice. We had set it up with bacteria. Now we're using it for fungi. You, can, you, you colonize the mice with um, a microbe. And then um, you check back and you see both by um, molecular techniques and also by culturing um, the, the duration of colonization. And what we found on the skin of the tissue, of the skin, and then also by looking at the tissue of the mice, is that candida auris, oh, first I should say this part. OK, so first of all, what we saw was that if you looked at the ear swabs, that um, candida auris was colonizing the skin of the mice both um, on the surface and also deeper into the tissue, whereas Candida albicans, as we knew, was colonizing um, the gut of the mice. And actually, Candida albicans, unless you give some antibiotics, you're not going to get good colonization in the stool. Um, and we did those kinds of experiments in the mice. And even then, um, we could get stool coloniz uh, gut colonization, but only if we really immune suppressed the mice and gave antibiotics. Skin seems to be the primary site of colonization for Candida auris. And it seems to persist on the mice for um, at least two months, and um, in some cases, up to four months. So that was um, our first um, clue that Candida auris really is a skin colonizer. And then we looked at where it was. And you can see it's on the skin surface. Um, but Candida auris, we were also finding it deeper inside the tissue in the sebaceous glands and in the hair follicles. And that kind of started to make sense where you could find with patients that they would be positive, and then they'd go negative, and then they could be positive again. So there's a deeper reservoir for candida auris in the um, appendages and the glands of the skin. Um, and as I said, there were initially these three, um, uh, sorry, initially there were these four clades. There may now be a fifth clade. But these clades um, are distinct enough that we can genetically identify them. And they have independently come to the US. Um, the largest um, outbreaks initially were in New York and Illinois. We're now seeing um, a lot of activity in other states, like in Nevada. But one of the things we saw was that some of these strains were more likely to be associated with transmission. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have changed these clade to clade names, sorry. Um, uh, clade 2 actually is the least associated with outbreaks. And you can see that it has the lowest colonization rate in the mouse skin. Um, we see very high levels of colonization with clade 3 and clade 1. Um, OK. 
So the, the, um, the outbreaks that we're seeing in the US um, are occurring primarily in these nursing homes. Um, and it does kind of intimidate me a little bit because there are some real experts on this in the field. So feel free to like um, chime in. Okay, so we're seeing these outbreaks in the nursing homes. And our questions were about why are these occurring in the nursing homes? But I kind of already told you that we think that there are some issues. So we shed our entire like human stem, skin stem cells. We, we shed our skin into the environment. Um, and what that means is that those dust bunnies that you're seeing you know, in your house and also in any you know, nursing facility, uh, we're going to shed you know, 10 to the 8th human cells per day. But along with that are going to come 10 to the 7th microbes. And that's a really hard thing. Like, if you think about a microbe colonizing a gut, you have to deal with fecal matter. But that's going to happen, like, kind of once a day or something. Whereas the skin is just constantly being shed. And there's really not much you can do to prevent someone from shedding their skin. And as we said, Canada auris is then you can um, culture from the environment. And it is still viable. OK. So we set out to ask about the sites of colonization and whether people were transmitting to themselves or transmitting to roommates. And here I'm going to sort of talk about how we made this shift, which I don't really have to explain to this audience. But we made this sort of shift where we talk about sequencing as a new lens to observe biology. And that's true for you know, attack-seq and RNA-seq. But it's really also true for microbial identification. And sequencing allows us to illuminate the microbial communities and the organism itself. So for the skin, the skin is a low biomass site. So we um, actually have taken a lot of efforts to think about what are the appropriate negative controls. And in each of these studies, when I swab the patient's skin, or when someone swabs the patient's skin, we also take an, an air sample and process that all the way through sequencing and then deposit all those reads so that you can actually see what are, um, what's the background rate of, con of contamination. We have optimized this so that we get like very few reads. And, um, and we also you know, publish what are our, our mock communities and our negative controls. But I think that's an important part of all of these experiments. So from the skin um, uh, DNA prep, you, can, you sort of have you know, at least two options. You can do amplicon sequencing, where you get the bacterial communities with the signature gene of the 16S. You can get the fungal community with the ITS1. Or you can do shotgun metagenomic sequencing. We also culture from the skin and do isolate or plate metagenomics. And I'm kind of going to run through all those things. OK. So for the skin. We've set up doing this with healthy volunteers to establish what are the different skin communities. Um, and our basic finding here was that the skin is an ecosystem and that the microbes that colonize the different parts of the body are about that um, body site as a, uh, um, as a nutrient source. So the oily sites are going to have more of the uh, cutibacterium, more of the malassezia. And we've looked at it um, from the uh, perspective of uh, uh, 16S, ITS1, shotgun metagenomic sequencing. OK. So here is um, how we, um, here's the nursing home in which we've done these studies in, um, in Chicago. So nursing homes in the US will often have um, shared rooms. Um, and in this nursing home, uh, these were some of the very earliest, um, uh, and sorry, now I seem to have lost the date. But these were some of the earliest cases in Chicago. And we've gone back to the beginning, where um, initially there was, there was um, an idea that you would see the cases. Um, but then you can see that in the fall, there was sort of a realization that maybe there were additional cases that weren't leading to clinical cases. And um, screening started being done. At which point, um, Illinois Department of Public Health realized that there actually were many more cases than they had realized. So why is it that we were um, having such a hard time controlling the spread in this nursing home? So um, 
to, in collaboration with Dr. Mary Hayden at Rush University Medical Center and Anna and Save at the Centers for Disease Control, we set up a, a cohort of 60 nursing home residents and we sampled 10 body sites three times for a month. Um, and what we did with culturing was we asked what were the sites that were colonized and found um, the highest site of colonization was the anterior nares. It had both the highest rate of positivity and the highest um, bio burden of Candida auris. At that point, the current recommendation was um, to screen the um, inguinal crease or the, the groin crease and the axilla, which was identifying um, in, in this way in which we did it only unilaterally, but in this case, it was identifying only two thirds of the positive cases. Um, we were finding high rates of colonization in the nares, um, also on the palms and fingertips um, of these patients. But the hard part is that um, we would have had, in this study, you'd have to survey six body sites to identify everyone who was positive. And that's really impractical. Um, so it's, a, it's difficult, because if you can be colonized anywhere and there's no single site that you can do surveillance on to find every positive patient, that is really hard, and that's probably part of the occult colonization. So this part I'm going to, um, uh, well, OK. So we, we were wondering, since we had the monthly surveys, what was the communities that were um, associated with Canada Oris colonization. This is the um, ITS1 sequencing, where we're looking at um, what was the community. And the black line represents the percent of Canada Oris. So in most cases, Canada Oris is the um, predominant candida, and the blue is malassezia, although these other spiky red lines that you'll see, that would be when we also found candida albicans. Um, and we looked also at the bacterial communities. So each one of these lines is an individual subject. Probably the easier way to understand it is to look at the microbial communities. Um, and what we were seeing was that while malassezia is the dominant fungi for healthy skin, we were seeing a lot of candida on these nursing home patients. And we've seen that in other nursing home patients. It's not just this one facility. We've seen it in multiple other facilities, um, including in facilities that aren't having candida auris outbreaks. Um, so what we're seeing is um, the dominant cluster is still, for the fungal communities, these malassezias. Um, but uh, we also saw patients with candida, um, other you know, diverse candida, and an atypical malassezia sleuthiae. So what we did was we built a model based on our monthly surveys, where we have this candida diverse community, and we said, what, what did that community look like the next month? And what we saw was that if you're malassezia diverse, there's an 80% chance that you would remain malassezia diverse. And there's only a 2% chance that you would transition to being um, Canada auris colonized. However, if you transition from malassezia diverse to candida diverse, at that point, there's a 38% chance you remain candida diverse and a 38% chance that you become candida auris colonized. So that at least takes us back a step in time to think about um, how um, what are the risk factors for um, Canada auris colonization? OK, so now I'm going to kind of move into some use like the, the rest of the talk to sort of talk about unpublished data of where are we now with this. OK, so we've got our um, cohort. And I've told you about our 16S and 9TS1. But our goal was also to understand about the transmission of Canada auris in this facility. And so, um, we um, have sequenced uh, 75 isolates from these uh, different patients and also done plate metagenomics um, because we're looking at what is the diversity amongst the subjects. And these are from primary culture plates. Um, and uh, the new data that I want to show you is about our analysis with shotgun metagenomics. But before I get to that, I have to tell you how we analyze shotgun metagenomics. And so let me take a little brief um, foray. Oops. Oh, it turns out I'm not going to talk about shotgun metagenomics. First, we're going to talk about Canada auris isolates. Did I mention that I haven't talked about this before? OK. So um, this part we know how to do. So um, here's our 75 isolates. And it's very hard to read. 
But these, um, this is a SNP tree based on the Canada Oris isolates that we have. And um, we're also um, rooting this on some isolates that, we, um, that were published from uh, the Chicago area. This is a Northwestern Memorial. Um, and we also um, sequenced in here the original isolates that came to Chicago five years ago. Um, so those are part of this tree. Um, and so you'll see that the Northwestern uh, subjects, they sort of, ours are any of these sort of short stubby names that's like gonna actually say subject for, you know, what body site. Okay. So sometimes we see great clustering where this is subject 53, um, and I'm gonna, this is like some isolates from the nose and from the toe web and from the fingers, and sometimes they cluster really well together, as you would expect if a subject is transmitting to themselves. Um, and so that would be great, because sometimes what we see is that there are very low um, SNPs between a subject and themselves, but sometimes there also are a lot of SNPs, but, or 20. I mean, this is still, these are still tiny numbers of SNPs. Um, between uh, different isolates from the same person. And this would be an example of someone like that where we're seeing isolates from the nares are different than the isolates from the toe webs or different than the isolates from the inguinal crease. And that's a little bit challenging. And what we find is that this individual um, is uh, a resident of room number one. And together in this room, are isolates from other individuals who also are in that room. So we're seeing a little bit of a hump here, where if you share the same room, then we are seeing sharing where one, isol one, you know, one person can have that isolate in their nose and the other person has it on their um, palms or on their toe web. So talking about sort of the environmental spread. And we see that in two different rooms in this facility that we see um, strain sharing within the room. OK, so now I am going to tell you about shotgun metagenomics and how we analyze that. OK, so shotgun metagenomics. Um, so what we do here is we really just you know, take the sample, make DNA, and then we've got the human reads, which we're not looking at, and the non-human reads. And the way most of the time we would do um, analyses is that we would take these non-human reads and we would basically do read mapping. But the dirty little secret that, of course, we knew and we put in like supplemental figure one was that we're not doing a great job of classifying these reads from the skin. So, well, you know, in many cases, we're only classifying 50% of the reads. And the only time we do better is if the site is dominated by Cutobacterium acnes, for which we have really good reference genomes. So we've got this dark matter. And so the question is, can we use the sequencing reads themselves? And here I was very fortunate to have Sara Saheb Kashef join the lab and work in collaboration with Alex Almeida and Rob Finn, who are here. And I actually met Alex for the first time at one of these meetings. So um, the, the challenge was, this had been done for the gut very nicely by um, Alex, Katie Pollard, um, and also Nicholas Zagata's work. Um, but how do we apply this to the skin? In that the skin, like the gut people, they have like enormous data sets to work with. We've got smaller data sets, but we have some interesting um, possibilities because we have multiple body sites from the same individual, and we see strains being shared between those body sites. Um, so Sarah, Alex, Rob, um, uh, worked really hard to do um, to to bring the mag pipeline over to the skin sites um, using um, the individual samples and also co-assemblies and we have an upset plot that shows that really the co-assemblies um, helped us to generate a lot more uh, metagenomic assembled uh, genomes mags and that they were of as high quality so from the skin reads, um, Sara was able to generate um, high quality mags. And the thing that we could do in the skin, because I'm always like, I'm aware that the gut microbiome has a lot of resources and opportunities. But there are some things that we can do in the skin that are harder to do in the gut. So we cultured directly from these subjects. 
And this meant that we could have genomes and we could do plate metagenomics also from these where we could then say, do we have the same thing, uh, this, an isolate for a mag? And that allowed us to really be, uh, to be more confident in our pipeline. So for example, this was a carinobacterium mag, metagenomic metagenome assembled genome that we recovered by a co-assembly of pooling across all the um, sequencing runs from different body sites of one healthy volunteer. So this was a novel carinobacterium mag and we also then um, cultured a carinobacterium isolate from the same healthy volunteer from their foot and I'm showing you here just the mummer plot with the, the mag on the uh, y-axis and the I, and, the, and the context from the isolate um, on the x-axis, and we had like 99% alignment. So we were able to do this with a number of our mags, identify the isolate also was very useful because now we have new isolates that we can set up functional studies with. So with this, um, the, the known mags, uh, sorry, the known isolates are in gray, um, and if we got a mag that matched a known genome, it was in blue. But the novel mags are in green, and they really decorate around the phylogenetic tree. And they weren't just like minor populations of the skin. No, here is a novel closest to a Neisseria. We named it, uh, we gave it some Candidatus pelobactum or something name. Um, and I'm um, sorry, in the lab we still call it QFNR01, which doesn't mean anything. Um, and what you can see is that here I'm looking at um, 18 different body sites and the relative abundance. And you can see that this novel mag is a fairly significant proportion of the reads. And we were just previously blind to it. And we see this with a number of um, novel mags. That they're, that they're present in you know, half of our samples, um, and they're often present in people we don't even know about. We also can use this MAG pipeline um, and, um, with UCC to identify novel fungi, um, well, to find MAGs of known fungi and also to identify novel fungi. And really also, SARA was um, used this to develop, uh, to find viruses. And in this case, we're finding jumbophage on the human skin and identifying them. And we can also identify oftentimes their host. So this is really a rich source of novel genomic material. OK, so mags. I now have confidence in them based on what we can do in healthy volunteers. We have identified novel bacterial species. Uh, fungal species, and thousands of novel viruses. And now this actually really does help us to do read mapping much better on our shotgun metagenomic data. OK, so back to Candida auris and how this is all going to make sense. OK, so we've got this shotgun metagenomic reads and um, from multiple different individuals. And so we start. Um, doing shotgun metagenomics, and then we're going to do mag identification, right? I have to show you this. Even though you all understood this, this is how I actually now try to explain to people how we do mags, like the human genome, right? So the human genome was like assembling one puzzle. But I think of mags now as if you gave me a box with like 100 puzzles in it, and you said, now, now you know, assemble all of those puzzles. And the way that this works for me is that those puzzles have different puzzle sizes, and they have different pa patterns on them. Some are landscapes. Some are you know, going to be human faces. And that's really an, a, an analogy for some of them have higher GC content. Some of them have different tetranucleotide frequencies. And that's how we're building multiple genomes from one sample. OK. So this, we take the shotgun metagenomic reads. And we did this because we wanted to know Here's the candida auris that I'm culturing. What's the candida auris that's on the skin? Because I had this idea even that maybe people would have dead candida auris on their skin that they picked up from the environment. And you'd see snips on their skin that were even different than what was cultured and alive. Because that's actually a really important point in clinical microbiology, that if you have microbes and they're on your skin, but they're dead, 
they're not going to transmit to you or the next person. So it's really important to know what's live. But I also wanted to do this because I think this shotgun metagenomics might be the easiest way to sort of understand what's on people's what's on people rather than doing all the culturing. Okay. So I set this, we set this up. Oh, it's a COVID project, and you know that because you're like sitting there in COVID and you're like, what do we have in the freezer that we can still sequence? <laughs> Pull these things out. And then some of them work out. So you're like, oh, that isn't COVID. Okay. So we set this up because we wanted to get the mags for Canada Auris. Okay. But you know, then we started analyzing it, and it wasn't just Canada Auris. We got full mags. So here, what you're seeing is the, the, you know, the diagram here. But anytime you have a bigger, so these are going to be on the, t on the um, God, I wish I would have tried to read this first. OK. Uh, these, these in the middle here, this is when you're getting a mag from Canada Auris, right? Um, and so we're getting a lot of mags from the nares and the inguinal crease. Um, and a few from the fingertips, and, a, and you know, a few from the anus, and a few from the toe webs. But we started to also see a lot of mags from other e organisms that we knew a little bit about. Um, like Jen said, that in the past, I've worked on Acinetobacter baumani, I've worked on Klebsiella pneumonia. So now I'm seeing these mags for Kleb pneumo, Acinetobacter. I'm seeing mags for E. coli, and these aren't just minor proportions. We're getting full, complete mags, like with all the ribosomal genes and everything. And when we do read mapping, where now this is each one of these is a sample from anus, fingers, inguinal crease, nares, toe web, we're getting fairly high proportion of some of these, um, what we consider, you know, possible multi-drug resistant organisms. And we're seeing them at high frequency. Whereas the sites of colonization that one typically screens for Kleb pneumo is the gut. Um, but it can be. There are some Kleb pneumos that you know, could live on the skin. So I, we, we have these mags in hand. And after I'm done, tell me if this is a story that you would have rather had presented in a different direction. OK, so we've got these mags, right? And these mags are complete genomes because they're there at high, this is a, as opposed to a normal skin, these genomes are there at high frequency, high relative abundance, and it's a much less diverse sample than what I was seeing with healthy volunteers. You have a fairly high dominance of these um, organisms. So we were able to complete these genomes. And from these genomes now, we're looking at the average nucleotide identity of the different mags we got from the different samples. So with Canada auris, they're pretty much very homogeneous. And really, the only times that you're seeing less than 100% you know, ANI is when it's an incom a, a less complete um, mag. But we're also seeing this tale of Acinetobacter baumani, Kleb pneumo, um, Pseudomonas, um, Staph petencophory that are also here at 100%. And we tried to display it here, where you're seeing a cluster of Acinetobacter baumani that look extremely um, highly similar, uh, also with Kleb pneumo. So that would suggest in each of these, if it's a different color, it's a different person. So that would suggest that we actually do have microbial sharing of the same um, strain amongst multiple individuals in this nursing home. So this would be an example. OK, this would be an example of Kleb pneumo, where you can see that we have this sharing. And so I pull this out now. And then there are some others that seem that are, that are distinct. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, if I have five samples from what is the same individual, that person has the same, you know, has the same Kleb pneumo. And that is not necessarily part of this cluster. But there is this cluster here. So here I'm showing you the phylogenetic tree where this is, a cluster, this is the cluster that we're seeing of um, Kleb pneumos down here. And you're also seeing some um, clustering up here. And now I pull this apart. And what I'm seeing is that this, these are all sequence type 147 Kleb pneumos. And we're finding these from multiple different individuals, multiple different time points. Um, and uh, they're all matching to sequence type 147, which is a strain 
that is circulating in the Chicago area and is um, NDM1 positive. So this is not, I mean, these are inguinal crease. Some of these are anal um, samples, um, and I'll point those out more carefully when I publish this. But um, <laughs> a lot of these are just from the skin sites, suggesting that when we previously had thought about clavnumo colonizing the gut, because that's where we do surveillance, uh, we are also finding it at very high relative abundance on the skin and you know, persistently there. So maybe this is an easier way to see it when you look at SNP-based analyses. And I just want to point out that you know, the y-axes aren't always the same. So the Canada auris um, isolates are fairly homogeneous. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see 15 SNPs different that you saw. But we're also seeing that with like, um, you know, what I just showed you with um, Kleb pneumo, where you have this wide cluster down here, um, and then other different sequence types. We're seeing it with E. coli. Mm, I think this is E. coli 131, also an, you know, a multi-drug resistant form of E. coli. Acinetobacter baumani. Um, interestingly, we see pretty much that everyone in this facility has the same clone of um, Staph petencophorae. And uh, we have seen Staph petencophorae in other you know, um, surveys of the skin. But it's interesting, because that might suggest, and I wonder what people think of this, that Staph petencophorae could be used as a sentinel, even when you, for um, that there is a lot of strain sharing occurring in this facility, even in the absence of an outbreak or a multi-drug resistant organism, that that could be a way that we could um, just do surveillance on saying you know, how much strain sharing is happening in this facility. Um, this we're still struggling with, but I want to sort of um, talk about this because you know, finding Kleb pneumo is scary, but really what's worrisome is if it's a multi-drug resistant form of Kleb pneumo. And you all know that it's hard when you do things and that wasn't your primary objective, but then you want to go to it. How do we justify this? Because we don't have, I mean, we have cultured isolates from the Chicagoland area of these organisms. So we know that we can map them to reference genomes that I just showed you, like the Kleb pneumo is the NDM1 strain. But we then went into our reads, um, we then went into our sequencing reads to say, do we find the reads for VIM, NDM1, KPC, right? And so one of the things I, I hope that we can talk about at this meeting is it is hard if you're using shotgun reads to associate a plasmid with a genome um, because that plasmid could be there at a different um, genomic frequency or different um, you know, than, a, than a genome. You all know you can get that plasmid at like 2x compared to the genome, maybe even higher. And that means it is hard for these mag pipelines to uniquely place a plasmid together with a chromosomal DNA. Um, and maybe there's some clever ways we could do it, um, but we also can do it where we basically can see that we find these um, plasmids at the you know, same frequency as the chromosome, even if it's two to one, in multiple different samples. But we did this here with read mapping. So what I'm showing you is an example here of subject 14. And on their toe web, we're finding um, the VIM gene. We're also finding the KPC gene. We're finding the um, KPC gene in the anus. We're finding it in whatever that is that I can't read. Um, and the other one I can't read in the inguinal crease. So we're finding the KPC gene where we're also finding um, organisms. This is actually um, associated probably, I think, with, an, um, with the E. coli. Um, the, um, and what we have from these subjects is I can show you the like where we're finding the mags. And what we have for these subjects is what they had the history of. So they had a history, you know, this subject um, would have had a, a history of MRSA. Um, and we can then find the, the um, MRSA mag in that patient. But a lot of times, um, the subject would have had a history of MRSA like 300 days ago, or we have someone who has, you know, NDM1, Kleb pneumo, but like 200 days ago. So we are seeing persistence on the skin, or they could have become recolonized, and you know, but we're finding these um, organisms still on the skin 
um, hundreds of days after it was documented um, that they had, you know, carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumani, uh, carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So, um, what I'm saying is that I went looking for Candida auris and I found basically the full escape because we found um, E. coli, Staph aureus, Klebnumo, Acinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterococcus faecalis on the skin of these patients in the nursing homes. So what we're seeing is that human skin is colonized at multiple sites with Candida auris, which poses a challenge for infection control. Candida auris persists deep inside the skin, posing a challenge for decolonization. The dysbiotic fungal skin community is a risk factor for subsequent Candida auris colonization. And what I'm showing with our newest data is that skin is a reservoir for these antibiotic resistant organisms, including this full escape. And that nursing homes, I want to say, um, are an essential component of the US healthcare ecosystem. Um, you know, that was true before COVID-19, and I think that became more evident with COVID-19. But that has always been true. Um, and so in conclusion, I'd just like to acknowledge the amazing people um, in my lab. This was when we got to go out on a hike in the Washington DC area. Um, and also my collaborators, um, uh, Heidi Kong, with whom I do my skin microbiome research, my colleagues at NIAID, uh, my colleagues at CDC who really got this um, whole project going um, at Rush University um, and here at the EMBL. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, that was terrifying. <laughs> Who needs cordyceps when you've got fecal patinas and the escape pathogens everywhere? Um, also, great anatomy lesson. All of us are like, oh, I didn't know that was a body part. Um, so thank you. Uh, we'll take questions um, from both in the room and online. I've got Alan, who is going to be checking online for any questions that come in. But if folks have a question in the room, um, please pop your hand up um, so we can see you and get the microphone to you. And I guess I could kick off with one, um, which is how are you communicating with infection control professionals in the nursing home system about this? You know, wh what are you hearing from them about prevention efforts on the ground? And is the work that you're doing suggesting any new directions that they might want to take with their infection prevention efforts? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. So um, through our work with um, CDC and also through um, Mary Hayden, um, we're very engaged with Chicago Department of Public Health and Illinois Public Department of Public Health. Um, so we actually do regularly monthly calls uh, with Stephanie Black and um, CDC colleagues, um, uh, which is, you know, Megan Lyman, Nancy Chow, Anna Lifton Seva, um, others when they can join. And in the Chicago region, um, they've really s switched over. Like, we're doing the research component, but this is really something that is being uh, addressed and handled um, at the public health labs. So um, uh, fortunately, with the influx of new resources um, as part of uh, American Recovery Act, uh, the CDC has um, sent a, a, um, a large amount of money to regional and statewide health departments to do sequencing, including of Candida auris. That actually was an important part for us to get Candida auris qualified as something that we could use antimicrobial resistance money for. So there, what you're seeing is um, they have the abilities and are very skilled at doing, you know, Canada or its genomic sequencing. What we're seeing then in Chicago is that this is a regional spread. And that, um, maybe I didn't say this very well, but we aren't seeing that you could dis I mean, we were hoping that you would be able to use this to say, oh, we admitted this patient and they have this signature, which is a signature of nursing home A or a signature of hospital B. And instead, what we're seeing is that Canada Aura seems to have a very slow rate of change. 
and we really can't distinguish the isolates that came from one hospital um, to our facility. And I think part of that is that we already have this spread of patients that are going in and out of healthcare sending. So it is sometimes hard. I'm not saying that all of these um, isolates are being spread within this one facility. You really could have had them spread in the previous facility and then admitted two patients from that same facility. So it is something about um, Mary Hayden and Chicago Department are very um, skilled and have, have looked at this question for Cleb Pneumo of thinking about things at a regional spread. We are still not clear of why no other clade has come into Chicago. So there are some places like California where there have multiple clades, but it really just hammers home to if you find Canada Oris in a facility, the CDC is very impactful in making sure that you um, control the initial cases. Because once you get to this point and we're doing containment, it is so much harder. All right, let's go to Bill. And then uh, we've got one from online. Thanks, Julie. That was um, awesome um, in, in many ways. But the one I really would like to know about is Candida auris in the environment in nursing homes. Are there some places it's more likely to be found than others? And might you be able to do environmental surveillance to detect its presence before it starts you know, kicking off and causing problems? Um, right. So, um, so we're um, fortunate to work with Mary Hayden and Susan Huang, who um, both were funded by the CDC, to come in, clean the room, and then look at like, you know, one hour, four hours, eight hours, twelve hours to see where they are seeing the spread. Um, and I, and, okay. So in, in the U.S., hospitals are not that excited about you you know, doing environmental surveillance and finding out where, <laughs> where it is. But that, that doesn't stop them from doing it. Right, OK. So we have, a, we have some information on that. And you know, we were, we were sort of horrified that, you know, after cleaning the room four hours later, we were finding Canada auris everywhere. Wow. And it's just like, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think when you shed from your skin and from the sheets, um, and it's, it's really hard to control, because um, you really do have microscopic particles. But if it's not causing disease immediately, right. it perhaps detect when people is coming in to be colonized. Yeah. Um, Get ready. Uh, so there's a really good XDRO registry in some cities. I think that would just come down to, you know, if you did the nasal screening and the axilla groin, you still might not get everyone, but you would get a lot of people, and that is now being done more commonly. Um, we'll get the I, mic down to Alan for an online all right. question. Yeah, and so we've got two. Oh, you've one got is, a mic on. Perfect. Yeah, and so the one is actually, which, which I'm just curious about as a follow-on from that, is when you actually show me the results here, have you subtracted the sequencing from the nursing staff itself, and I'm just wondering if it's possible to do some sort of tracing, because if you're looking at a four hour time interval, these homes have substantial hands-on assistance, uh, you know, across the facility. Right. Um, so, um, um, so we went through this with the KPC outbreak at the NIH Clinical Center. I mean, it, you know, unless you have strong evidence that the staff is transmitting. I mean, we, it, we didn't screen the staff. Um, and I, I think that's a, a tipping point for us, is that we don't, we think of Canada Oris pretty much as more likely to colonize patients who are um, on antibiotics. I mean, these are nursing home patients. A lot of them are on antimicrobials, you know, and we think of them as being more susceptible to infection than healthy, normal people who are working in the facility. But we have not screened um, healthcare workers. We did that at the NIH Clinical Center, um, but we did that where um, we screened healthcare workers as part of a research protocol, and people volunteered to yeah. be part of that study. Um, and that allowed us to get a baseline information, which was that 
um, of healthcare providers, we did not have any who were colonized with KPC organisms. So it, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit tricky, especially in this case where you don't have any ability to decolonize people. Can I, mean, I just ask a question online from Caroline, and the question is around the accuracy of your mag assemblies. And the question is around how do you ensure that the mags are properly assembled, and especially if these new genomes have not been cultured? Um, so um, you get kind of a, a bag of contigs. You know, it's not, we, we, I mean, I think we don't know how to order the contigs, if that's what you mean by assembly. Mm. but. Um, it, it, is a, it is a computational process by which we think that we have these mags and then we're able to QC um, many of them. Pretty much the way that we're doing it is that, um, I think I can show you an example from our fungi. So this would be an example of how we QC it where we, we, we had these mags, these are from fungi. And what we do then is that we take all the individual reads, uh, sorry, individual samples. So it might have been that this uh, mag was assembled from a co-assembly. But then we go back and we're looking at all of the individual samples and we make sure that we get even coverage across the entire genome. Um, and there are cases where we, th we do that and we then think that we actually have a chimeric mag because we'll see different rates of um, coverage. And so that's probably the, the best way that we do that. But there's a lot of processes, you know, looking at single copy genes. There's a, I mean, the process for making mags has been fairly hardened in the last um, year or two. Um, and, you know, that's through the great efforts of the sort of um, three or four groups, um, you know, Stephen Nafak, um, Nicholas Sagata, and Alex Almeida and Rob Finn coming together. All right. I don't see oh, one more hand. This will be our last question before the break. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that you do air samples also as negative controls. Can you say a bit more about how you sample air and to get enough input material for making a library for sequencing? Um, right. So it turns out you don't need any material to make a library. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is, um, but so we do. We. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, with the next hair kits, a lot of times even our skin samples, it's very hard to quantitate them. So we just put in the maximum amount, make a library and sequence it. Um, from our skin samples, we'll be generating like 100 million reads and we'll put them in at the same amount and we'll get like 10,000 reads from the negative controls. So that already tells us that, you know, this is a, a basically a no biomass sample. But so what we've done, and we, we put this in sort of like into the methods section, like we'll have, um, you know, 200 negative controls. And so we just um, aggregate them all and look there if we see anything. I think that's still important in terms of um, what we're looking for there is, are there any reagent contaminants? Um, are, we have definitely, when we work with new people, they, you know, we now aliquot the buffer for them. Um, but there are a lot of ways to get error into a low biomass sample. Um, the other way that can happen is that if your positive controls, like a mock community, you can start to see those reads. Um, I mean, we, we, we detect that when we look at other people's samples sometimes, that you see sort of their, their positive control kind of bleeding through into their low biomass samples. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing is, I mean, when you sequence it, then we do, we aggregate all the negative controls from a study and run them through the pipeline as if they were a sample. Um, and we certainly also, I should say, the other kind of controls we do, you know, when we're doing large studies, you sometimes see the negative control has 50 million reads and one of the samples has 10,000 reads. Well, it's pretty clear what's happened there. Um, but we just throw those samples out. But the human samples are very useful to us too. We consent everyone for human genome sequencing. And so we then look at the human reads and make and do like a quick assessment of um, SNPs and gender and everything like that. 
And we use that to make sure that if we get 18 body sites from someone at three different times, their gender you know, and kind of SNP diversity for you know, kind of proxy race ethnicity, that should be the same for all 50 samples. And I can tell you that the only time we ever get confused is the gender of individuals as judged by their feet. We will see that, <laughs> you know, coming back to what we're seeing, we see like weird, crazy things on their feet, like, you know, someone's plantar heel will suddenly be that they are like triple, you know, triple X, Y, and it's a female. Or they're like, you know, I mean, just all sorts of, all sorts of things that we've seen, you know, um, and, and, and that's sort of like, for us, at first it, con it concerned us, but then we're like, oh yeah, they're always from the feet. And it really is an indication of how much material we're finding from people just walking around their own homes. So thank you all. <laughs> uh, join me again in thanking Julie.